Welcome back guys. Now in this video, let's discuss about thyroid hormones. First of all, let's see some important points about the thyroid gland. Guys, whatever I am showing you here, the simple diagram is representing the thyroid gland with the two lobes. Okay, thyroid gland is somewhere in the two lobes. Right now, I just want you to know what are the cells, what are the types of cells which are present in the thyroid gland. The first cell type which I am showing you here, okay, the group of cells which are arranging in a concentric manner. See, these group of cells which are in green color, they are called as follicular cells. Okay, let me write it down here. Now, these green color cells are called as follicular cells. Now, these follicular cells are the ones which will produce and store thyroid hormones. So, thyroid hormones T3 and T4. So, thyroid hormones T3 and T4 are produced by which cells guys? It's the follicular cells. Now, if you see side to the follicular cells, side means para. Side to the follicular cells, there are other type of cells. So, these cells which are in white color, they are present side to the follicular cells. Side means para. So, these white color cells are called as para follicular cells. So, para follicular cells are also present in thyroid gland. Now, what is the function of these para follicular cells? Let me write it down here. Para follicular cells. Now, these para follicular cells are the ones who are going, uh, are the ones producing calcitonin okay calcitonin guys don't confuse it with calcitriol calcitriol is active form of vitamin d3 which helps in increasing the blood calcium levels and helps in the bone formation now para follicular cells are the ones which produce calcitonin now if you ask me what is the function of this calcitonin the function of calcitonin is to decrease the blood calcium levels so, decreases the amounts of blood calcium level. So, whenever there is high levels of calcium in the blood, now calcitonin will be produced. Calcitonin bring back the calcium level to normal states. Okay. Now, I just want to know, I just want you to know one more point here. So, calcitonin is the one which decreases the blood calcium levels. Then who increases the blood calcium levels? So, the blood calcium levels are increased by vitamin D. Blood calcium levels are also increased by parathyroid hormone. Okay, so let me show you here. See, back to the thyroid gland, you have four parathyroid glands. Okay, back to the thyroid gland, there are four parathyroid glands. Now, these parathyroid glands, they will produce which hormone, guys? So, they produce parathyroid hormone. So, what is the function of this parathyroid hormone? Increase the blood calcium levels. Even vitamin D also increases the blood calcium levels. Okay, now having said that, let's see how the follicular cells produce T3 and T4. That is the synthesis of the thyroid hormone. Before discussing about the synthesis of thyroid hormone, what is the, what are the raw material needed for the production of thyroid hormone? What are the raw materials? The first important raw material is the iodide. Okay, so iodides are very much important for the synthesis of T3 and T4. So, from where do we get these iodides? Iodides are coming from the food. Okay, so iodized salt or like you know the food, uh, the seafoods which are rich in iodine, whenever you consume them, iodine is going to enter into your body. So, in which form? So, actually, these iodides they are negatively charged. Okay, iodine is having negative charge. Now, why I am saying this? Because these iodides is going to be converted into iodine. Okay, inside the follicular cells that we will discuss in a few minutes. But in the beginning, important point is whenever you consume iodide salt or whenever you consume sea products, okay, seafoods, then you will get plenty of iodine into your body. And that's a raw material for the production of T3 and T4. Now, here the yellow color cell which I am showing you, one cell that is a follicular cell. Okay, one follicular cell I am showing you. Now, what this follicular cell is doing? See, this follicular cell is going to uptake this iodides in. So, iodides from the blood are going to be uptaken by the follicular cells. Now, this iodide uptake is going to happen along with sodium. So, the transporter which is helping in absorption of iodine is also called as sodium iodide symporter. Okay, symporter why? Because same, same side transport. So, what is the type of transporter which is present on the basolateral uh, membranes of the follicular cells? It's the sodium iodide symporter. Okay. Now, why I am so specific about this is because, for example, if you want to inhibit the thyroid hormone production, 
one way to inhibit thyroid hormone production is that you can inhibit this transporter whenever you inhibit this transporter iodides are not going to enter into the cell when iodides are not there thyroid hormone production cannot be happening okay you can use such kind of drugs in thyrotoxicosis states or whenever the person is suffering with hyperthyroidism so in those conditions to treat that hyperthyroidism you can block this transporter okay so what is the transporter name again important sodium iodide symporter okay now we got the raw material into the cell that's the iodine uh, iodides are entered into the cell but for the uh, formation of t3 t4 we want the iodine not iodide we just don't want that negative charge so what will happen now this iodides are going to be sent into a region okay called as colloid okay with the help of a transporter called as a pendrin so pendrin is a transporter which is present on the luminal side okay or the colloid side actually you will get it out what exactly is colloid guys please concentrate here all the follicular cells they are surrounding like you know they are they are forming a circle and the space between them okay in the center there is this space right this space is called as a colloid that, that's the place where t3 and t4 are getting stored so now our iodides are coming into the colloid now whenever they are entering there was this very, very important enzyme which is present here that's called as thyroid peroxidase now thyroid peroxidase is an enzyme okay let me write it with green color very important enzyme thyroid peroxidase tpo is an enzyme which is present on the colloid side which will convert the iodides into iodine now we have iodine okay now we have iodine okay now what will happens so this iodine need to be organified now what exactly is this organification before discussing about that let me tell you about a protein called as thyroglobulin please concentrate this is follicular cell now inside the follicular cell a protein is getting produced okay a new protein is getting formed what is the name of that protein guys see here thyroglobulin are you able to, are you able to appreciate this strand here which i am showing you that's nothing but the thyroglobulin so these follicular cells are the ones who are going to produce thyroglobulin here intentionally i have made this white dots okay on the thyroglobulin i have made this white dots what exactly are these white dots representing those white dots are nothing but the tyrosine amino acids okay tyrosine okay so we can say that thyroglobulin is a protein which is having high amounts of these tyrosine amino acids or tyrosine residues okay sir what will happen now now somehow this thyroglobulin protein it will also come into our colloid now in our colloid what are there sir iodine molecules are there along with iodine molecules thyroglobulin is also there now what we have to do we have to mix the iodine with the thyroglobulin we have to take this inorganic iodine okay iodine is inorganic thing right it's a uh, it's an element so we have to take this iodine and we have to fuse it with the protein protein is something organic so what we are doing right now we are going to add this iodine on to thyroglobulin if you properly concentrate here on the thyroglobulin molecule see i am showing you thyroglobulin here on the thyroglobulin molecules iodine is being added now in this molecule there is only one iodine but on the other thyroglobulin molecules there are two iodines and even on the other thyroglobulin molecules there are two iodines okay so what's being happening here iodine is being added on to thyroglobulin this process is called as organification okay so who is doing this organification which enzyme is uh, like you know involved in this organification process again same enzyme thyroid peroxidase tpo okay so thyroid peroxidase is doing first process that is oxidation and thyroid peroxidase is also involved in second process where the iodides are being added on to thyroglobulin this is called as organification now what will happen sir see we are having a thyroglobulin molecule molecule with one iodine this is called as monoiodothyronin okay let me write it here m i t m i t molecule what is monoiodothyronin monoiodothyronin means mono iodine one iodine molecule is present on the thyroglobulin that is called as monoiodothyronin now there was this other molecule where on thyroglobulin there are two iodines this is called as diiodothyronin dit so monoiodothyronin is there diiodothyronin is there now whenever you take one monoiodothyronin see this is the monoiodothyronin 
and I am now taking one diiodothyronine. Whenever you fuse them, so this is called as coupling. Whenever you are bringing them together, you are coupling them. So this coupling process, whenever you do, that will form T3. So T3 means what exactly that 3 representing? 3 representing 3 iodine molecules. So, okay. So whenever you fuse a monoiodothyronine with the diiodothyronine, you will get T3. Okay, triiodothyronine. Now, whenever two DID molecules, whenever two diiodothyronine molecules, whenever they fuse, whenever coupling happens between two DIDs, you are going to end up with the T4. That's called as T4 is called as a thyroxine. Okay, this is how T3 and T4 are formed. Now, important question is, who is doing this coupling reaction? Which enzyme? Again, same, thyroid peroxidase. So, thyroid peroxidase is such an important enzyme, which is uh, involved in the process of thyroid synthesis. It does oxidation organification as well as coupling reactions all these three important reactions are under the control of thyroid peroxidase okay guys now see yes at the end of the day we have t3 and t4 now t3 and t4 which are like you know produced they can be stored in the colloid for how much time they can be stored for almost two to three months okay once they are formed they can be stored for almost two to three months now Please see here, thyroid peroxidase is an enzyme which is involved in, which steps oxidation, organification and coupling reaction. Oxidation means conversion of iodides into iodine. Organification means the iodines are being added on to thyroglobulin molecules. Coupling reaction means mixture of, like you know, fusing of one uh, DIT with the, uh, one DIT with the MIT or two DITs together forming T3 and T4. Now, congenital TPO deficiency. Guys, right now we are going to discuss, like you know, I have a clinical link. Whenever the patient is having congenital thyroid peroxidase deficiency, means by birth itself, this fellow is having deficiency of TPO. Now, in this fellow, can he have thyroid hormone production? Definitely not. So, what is the name of that syndrome? The name of the syndrome is called as Pendred syndrome. Okay, Pen, D-R-E-D, -E Pendred syndrome. Okay, so what is the problem in Pendred syndrome? There is congenital absence or deficiency of the thyroid peroxidase. So, he is going to suffer with which conditions guys? Just think logically, whenever he is not having thyroid peroxidase, T3-T4 production is not going to happen. So, he will suffer with congenital, congenital hypothyroidism. Okay, congenital hypothyroidism as well as these patients will be having sensory neural hearing loss. So, Pendred syndrome is like you know in this Pendred syndrome the clinical features are congenital hypothyroidism as well as the sensory neural hearing loss. Now, after this let us discuss a very important concept which is called as wolf chaikov effect. What, has, what exactly is this wolf chaikov effect? It is very very simple guys try to understand like this. Imagine today if you get a million dollars, are you going to work from tomorrow? If you get a million dollars or a 10 million dollars right now, are you going to work? Definitely you are not going to work from tomorrow. Why? Because you are saturated. You are not going to work. In the same way, whenever you supply iodine molecules to the thyroid gland, okay, normally in a, in a normal uh, quantities, thyroid gland is going to function. Thyroid gland will uptake the iodine, helps in the production of T3-D4. But whenever you give too much amount of iodine at a time, so excessive iodine will inhibit the thyroid hormone synthesis. Just like excessive money will make you lousy, in the same way, excessive amounts of iodine at a time will also inhibit the thyroid hormone production. Normal iodine, normal T3-T4 production. Excessive iodine intake will decrease the T3-T4 hormone production. That effect is called as wolf chaikov effect. So, let's see what exactly is wolf chaikov effect. Please concentrate. Giving Lugol's iodine. It's just simple iodine. Giving Lugol's iodine to patient leads to transient inhibition of organification process. Okay. If you give this excessive Lugol's iodine organification process we have discussed just right now. Organification is a very important process in the thyroid hormone production. Whenever organification is being inhibited, automatically T3 and T4 synthesis will also be inhibited. So, this is a transient uh, transient effect. Okay, we are going to be there for some time. 
So at the end of the day, what is wolf chaikoff effect? wolf chaikoff effect is decrease in the T3, T4 hormone production because of excessive iodine. Okay. Now, what are the other important points which you need to know? Uh, if you take excessive amounts of Lugal's iodine, not only T3, T4 hormone production will go down, but also remember the size of the gland will decrease. Okay, the size of the gland is going to be decreased as well as the vascularity of the thyroid gland is going to be decreased. So the glands become less vascular, the gland decreases in the size and the T3, T4 hormones which are like you know there in the thyroid glands are also go down. Now, you might think, sir, how this is going to be helpful? Why should we know this wolf check off effect? It's because actually this wolf check off effect comes into handy or comes into a very important role before surgery. See, try to understand like this. Imagine you have a, a patient who is having multinodular goiter or a solitary goiter. A patient came to you. He is having a goiter. Means a big thyroid gland. There are multiple nodules in his thyroid gland. Now you decided to go for the surgery. Now you are operating the patient on the table, operation table like you are right now you are in the operation theatre, you are doing the surgery. Now what will happen whenever you are trying to resect the tumour, accidentally you may also break the tumour. Whenever the tumour got damaged from the colloid, from the colloid lots of T3 and T4 may spill it into the systemic circulation that excessive amount of T3, T4 will cause thyrotoxicosis, will cause a thyroid storm like excessive amount of T3 and excessive amount of uh, T3 and T4 will increase the heart rate, will increase the body temperature. So that condition is called as thyroid storm and the operation table itself the patient can die because of the tachycardia and hyperthermia. So before surgery what we have to do? Before planning the surgery itself we have to decrease the size of the thyroid gland. We have to decrease the vascularity of thyroid gland. We have to decrease the production of T3 and T4 inside the thyroid gland. So, what we are going to do before going to surgery, one month before, we are going to start the patient on this Lugal's iodine. Every week we are giving the Lugal's iodine before the surgery. So, what this Lugal's iodine is going to do? Lugal's iodine decreases the T3, T4 hormone production by wolf Chekhov effect. The size of the thyroid gland is going to be decreased and the vascularity of the thyroid gland is going to be decreased. If there is decreased vascularity means decrease the hemorrhage during the surgery. Okay, so everything is going to be beneficial. So, that's what is called, that's what is the wolf Chekhov effect guys. Now, let's discuss about jod basidov effect. What's happening in this jod basidov effect? Now, whenever you give radioactive iodine to the person, now that radioactive iodine will stimulate the T3, T4 hormone production. Now, you will get it out. Sir, why the hell are we giving this uh, radioactive iodine? Actually, there is something called as thyroid scan. Okay, if you want to know whether there are any nodules inside the thyroid gland, like you know, how, the, uh, how the thyroid gland is functioning, there is something steady called as thyroid scan where you are going to give the patient inject the patient with radioactive iodine all this radioactive iodine will be uptaken into the thyroid gland and now from the thyroid gland this radioactive iodine is going to emit the radiation and that radiation can be captured with x-rays okay so what exactly is thyroid scan thyroid scan is nothing but giving radioactive iodine and capturing the radiation okay that's something a study but whenever you are giving iodine, this iodine can also stimulate the thyroid hormone production. So what is jod basidov effect? After injecting, after giving this radioactive iodine, that iodine is causing hyperthyroidism in the patient. So iodine induced hyperthyroidism is called as jod basidov effect. And I have already taught you when you are going to see this jod basidov effect, usually seen after radioactive iodine scan. Now, let's discuss about the half-life of some important radioactive iodines. See here, there is radioactive iodine-131, radioactive iodine-123 and radioactive iodine-132. Guys, this question is very very important which will keep on coming up in your exams. What is the half-life of iodine-131? Half-life of iodine-131 is, remember it is 8 hours, not, sorry, not 8 hours, it's 8 days. Okay, 8 days and half-life of uh, radioactive iodine 123 is 12 to 14 hours, not days, 12 to 14 hours and 132 is having a half-life of 2.5 hours. Okay, these are the half-life of 
different radioactive iodines okay after radioactive iodine if the patient is developing hyperthyroidism then it is called as jot basidow effect okay guys now let's discuss about thyrotoxicosis factitia what exactly is thyrotoxicosis factitia very simple thyrotoxicosis is happening in a person because of excessive intake of thyroid hormones the person is excessively taking thyroid hormones now these thyroid hormones are causing symptoms are the clinical features so that is thyrotoxicosis factitia now you may get a doubt now why the person is consuming excessive amount of thyroid hormones why for example let's take a scenario like this we all know that thyroid hormones are catabolic hormones thyroid hormones increases the basal metabolic rate thyroid hormone causes the lipolysis so thyroid hormone decreases the weight of the person we all know this imagine that there was this one female who is obese or a male who is obese and they know this concept of the action of thyroid hormones so now this female who is obese now what she is doing is she is abusing the thyroid hormones she is taking excessive amount of thyroid hormones okay she bought the t3 t4 hormones like your thyroid hormones from the uh, ph uh, ph pharmacy now she is every day taking excessive amount of t3 t4 now what this t3 t4 will do yes definitely this t3 t4 whatever she is taking it will definitely increase the basal metabolic rate definitely increase going to increases the process of lipolysis but she is abusing these hormones excessively she is taking these hormones now these hormones will cause symptoms of hyperthyroidism or these hormones will cause um, uh, symptoms because of excessive amount of t3 uh, t4 so this condition is called as a thyrotoxicosis in this female there is thyrotoxicosis okay so this is thyrotoxicosis factitia now let's take one example or one variant of thyrotoxicosis factitia which is called as hamburger toxicosis now what is this hamburger toxicosis hamburger toxicosis is due to ingestion of a thyroid gland see there are a certain group of people especially from the south american countries now south american country people they used to take this thyroid gland in their diet now whenever you consume this thyroid gland of a cattle okay of a cattle now excessive amount of t3 t4 is entering into your body now this excessive amount of t3 t4 are the ones which are causing the symptoms so hamburger's toxicosis is a condition where ingestion of a thyroid gland of an animal like cattle or sheep is leading to thyrotoxicosis okay now let's discuss about some important points about this t3 t4 we have seen how t3 t4 are produced but they are getting stored in the colloid and they are going to come into the blood anyway now in the blood t3 is going to bind with t3 is going to bound with albumin albumin and t4 is going to mainly bind with globulins they are called as thyroid binding globulins Okay, which are also called as the TBGs. So what I am saying is, T3 is going to mainly bound with the albumin in the blood, and T4 is going to be mainly bound with the thyroglobulin TBGs. And some amount of T3 and T4 as well as vitamin A, they are going to all of them. Uh, they they can use one more important protein for the transport in the blood, which is called as trans thyretin. Okay, so trans thyretin are pre albumin. So trans thyretin or pre albumin is a, a protein which is present in the blood. It can bind with T3, T4 as well as vitamin A. But 1%, 1% of T3, T4 are in free form. So 1% of T3 and 1% of T4, they are not bound with any plasma proteins. They are simply freely circulating in the blood. And we all know that free forms are the active form. Free T3 is the actual one who shows the effects. Okay. Now after this, let's see important differences between T3 and T4. Guys, out of this T3 and T4, who is really active? Active form is a T3. Inactive form is T4, which means... T4 is going to convert into T3. T4 will be converted into T3, and T4 is the one which shows the uh, which shows the actions. So T4 is a less active form. It will be converted into T3. So T3 is the active form. 
Now, out of this T3 and T4, who is having a short half-life? Yes, whoever is active, they will be having short half-life. They will act and they will become inactivate. So, T3 is having shorter half-life of how many days? Only one day. T3 will be active only for one day. But T4, it can be active up to 6 to 7 days, almost one week. So, T4 is having long half-life. Okay, T4 is an actual store, actual store. Whenever you need T3, then only T4 will be converted into T3. Actual storage form is T4. Okay, so now who is going to give the negative feedback? The actual stores determine the negative feedback. Whenever you have proper amount of stores, a negative feedback will be given to the pituitary gland and thyroid gland as well as the hypothalamus. So, T4 is the one which gives the negative feedback. Whenever you have sufficient amounts of T4, this T4 will downregulate the hypothalamus as well as pituitary. Now, T3 is not giving any negative feedback, but important point is T4 gives negative feedback. And T3 and T4, who is more in blood? T4 is more in blood. In peripheral tissues, whenever needed, T4 will be converted into T3. T4 will be converted into the T3. And who is having fast action? Definitely, T3 will be having fast action. T4 will be having slow action. So, these are the important differences between T3 and a T4. Hope the video is helpful. Thank you guys. In the next video, we'll be discussing about the effects of thyroid hormone. How thyroid hormones are going to affect the bodily function. How they are going to affect the metabolism. And also, we are going to discuss about the thyroid drugs. How to treat hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. We'll discuss in the next video. Hope the video is helpful. Thank you.